It turned out that recently there was a decision between Epic Systems Corporation versus Lewis, where the notorious RBG came out with a dissent. And basically, people were trying to shift away from arbitration over, over wages, and they wanted to move into class action lawsuits over, over individual wages. And uh, Judge Gorsuch came out and said, look, the 1926 Arbitration Act uh, supersedes everything that's going on here. I mean, there is some claim in the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. And the key statement is over this issue about other concerted activities, whether you could go outside that. And so Gorsuch said no. But uh, the, it was a 5-4 decision, and so the liberal justices went in the other direction. And so one of the key phrases, though, was the sense says that the decision is going to drive us back to the labor markets, all the way back to the period of the 1920s. Uh, and those kind of situations where collective bargaining wasn't really allowed, actually, it was really just moving us back to 2011. But, but I'm here to talk to you about what these actual labor markets actually look like and what the labor legislation looked at at the time. So mostly what you have is implicit labor contracts during the time. Most people weren't signing written contracts. The only real written contracts were union contracts in a lot of these cases, and they don't necessarily cover everything. And essentially, state law governed almost everything at this time period. There are hardly any federal reg regulation unless it was involved in interstate commerce, like railroads. Uh, and even in the case of railroads, they had a lot of states regulating as well, because there are a number of railroads that operated only intrastate in those situations. And so the, the basic statement has always been that freedom of contract always had ruled because the Lochner decision about bakers in New York City that they, they attempted to limit the hours per day that bakers worked. And so the Lochner decision in a 5-4 Supreme Court case actually came out and said, no, you can't limit those laws. What the real battle was about was whether freedom of contract versus health and safety. And so what you can see is the same kind of issues we're fighting about today. And this, the issues we were fighting about back then and today are things like, well, how well do labor markets actually work? Can people, are people mobile enough? And can they talk to enough employers and move between employers easily enough that, they, that the labor markets actually work to protect workers? Or do you need unionized representation, collective bargaining to protect workers? Or do you need legislation to do that? And so the real fight at the time was over health and safety. And so, this paper is really about regulations and flux, and there are two, t two parts to the paper. The first part is about uh, direct regulation over wages and hours during this time frame. And the issues there are really about stability and how, how stable are these laws over time. And, you, and there's a lot of variation across states. And one of the things you're going to find is there's a, lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty to some extent about what the Supreme Court's going to do, because the Supreme Court turns over three times over this 30-year period, and they have a whole series of 5-4, some 4-4 decisions that determine what's going to happen about constitutionality. And then a number of states are out there just doing their own thing, you know, no matter what the constitutionality was, or they're passing new laws, and then they finally settle what they're going to do in the, in the late 1930s. The second part of the paper is about collective bargaining laws at the state level and how they influenced what was going on. And so this is a whole different atmosphere than what we see today because unions did not, are not in a position where if they voted to have 50% or more of workers being represented, they couldn't force the employer to deal with them because the employer had the right to, to associate with whoever they wanted to appoint to. So it was really freedom of association for workers among themselves versus freedom of association for employers with workers that was at hand in a lot of these cases. And if you want to talk about a situation where rule of law was, was an issue, this is one where it was an issue because they have all sorts of violent strikes and all sorts of things. And literally, there are thousands of people marching on Blair Mountain, West Virginia, with hundreds of, of state militia and uh, and deputies waiting for them and these kind of things. And so in some of these things, you know, as many as 40 or 50 people get killed over the span over a six-month strike, sometimes over a year-long strike. OK, so the second half is about this freedom of association versus, versus freedom well, between two types of freedom of association. And at that time, the Supreme Court had ruled that you could sign non-union pledges. And the, the argument for the non-union pledge was, in the original Hitchman, Cole, and Co. case, where, which kind of ultimately decided at the Supreme Court level in 1917, the reason that the workers signed the pledge was that the, the, the union was trying to get them to strike, and they didn't want to strike. And part of the pledge was is the employer's promise 
to pay the wages that were being paid by the union or even pay better wages. And so both sides decided to sign the contracts because they just didn't want to strike anymore. They didn't want to get involved in the big battles. And they wanted to go ahead and go to work. Now, one of the issues that comes up is, is the federal government treats collective bargaining differently at different times. So during World War I, the War Labor Board, which was actually voluntarily constructed, it wasn't created by statute, they actually actively supported collective bargaining, and as did President Wilson. And so they actually didn't, didn't you couldn't use the non-union pledges. They had everybody collective bargaining. But it really didn't have the force of law because it was a voluntary situation. The war ends, and all of a sudden, everything's up for grabs again. And so they spend five years fighting about it. And then finally, the unions essentially lose and are weak for quite some time. And then things open up again in 1932. The Great Depression is a great leveler in this and a great mind changer for a lot of people. Uh, so you see a big emphasis on, well, we're not paying people well enough. Uh, wages are falling too much. And so we need to protect people a lot more. But between 1932 and 37, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the true collective bargaining law is and what the rules are going to be. And that you have tons of strikes during this time frame a lot, and a great deal of uncertainty. So one of the things I wanted to try to do in the last part of the paper, this is new from what people saw in April, was to actually look at the impact of various state laws related to collective bargaining and arbitration on violence and strikes and strike activity. So I'm going to show you some results from that. I wouldn't call them causal. They, they use some of the techniques that Christos uses here. Uh, but they you know, give you an idea what the associations is, are. So that's my goal. So the, the essence with this, you know, I was trying to think of what definitions of rule of law. I've always struggled with this and find good ways. I'm using the ABA definition from the World Justice Project, Project. And one of the things that got me involved in the first part was actually the issue of just laws. Um, and you have open government. These are the basics of what's going on. Accountability, just laws, publicized, stable, and just. Open government where the processes are accessible and fair and efficient. And access, accessible and impartial dispute regulation. So the key words in this that I, they're kind of drive a lot of this is stability, fairness, and justice. And so I'm really kind of looking at this in a lot of cases. You know, laws change all the time. And so the question you've got is, are they really violating the rule of law in some of these cases? Or is this just evolution in the rule of law as you move along? So the, the, the big thing here is most of the law that's going on about labor markets during this time period, about the contract itself, the implicit contract, really the vast majority of the laws are about safety. OK, and so the, the, and those seem to go through without too much problem. They don't seem to see too much constitutional challenge, unless Will tells me different in just a few minutes. The, uh, the, the battleground laws are wages and hours laws. And so for hours, the battlegrounds, they have battlegrounds for hours for men. And the battle is over whether or not they need to protect it for health and safety reasons or, or freedom of contract. Should they be able to do whatever they want to do in, in negotiating their own hours? And then the other part is wages, minimum wages. And so women, they decide they're going to protect women in terms of hours legislation because they're in a position where we need to protect not only them from the kind of work that they're doing, but also we need to project, be able to protect them for societal reasons, for reproduction reasons, and all sorts of things like this. So some of the, some of the language being used is kind of interesting to see. Men, they, they, the hours things becomes, uh, is, is more back and forth, depending on how health and safety things are going. But the minimum wage laws are also, the, the battle is over health and safety versus freedom of contract. So the early limits, however, so people claim that there were no limits on men in terms of hours that they could work. But the Supreme Court had ruled a number of different kind of hours laws were actually constitutional. And typically, it was a case like in mining or railroading where you could actually claim that there was a safety issue about working long hours. And particularly for railroading or street railroads is very important because it wasn't just the safety of the worker. It was public safety of the public who are riding and of the, the, the people or the consumers. Uh, and so you see these first three, 1898, 1905, they actually uphold the laws because they're involved in, in kind of dangerous industries. The outlier in some ways is Lochner, the Lochner decision about bakers. And the real dispute there was about whether there was, safe, there was a safety issue. And the judges who, who voted against Lochner decided that the, there wasn't much of a safety issue in this context. And so freedom of contract ruled. And then you kind of move down. And then there's some decisions in, about Oregon and about the railroad acts with respect to laws or whatever. And they actually uphold the, the constitutionality. And there are a number of state laws where they limit, limit hours with respect to dangerous industries where they uphold that as well. 
So there is this freedom of contract thing, but that tension between freedom of contract and, and health and safety runs throughout all these various areas. So and one of the things you'll see is even if the, the states are actually passing a bunch of new railroad hours laws as well, because they want to make sure to cover intrastate workers in a lot of these various cases. Now, you know, those, I, I'm not talking very much about the fights to get these things in place, but yeah, it's very interesting. A lot of times, my, the work I've been doing on labor legislation has suggested that most of the time you don't get these laws in place unless you go get a group of employers who are willing to go along with the reformers and the workers in these contexts, and they oftentimes codify what the, what the leading employers are already doing. So the employers get a little bit of an advantage in this context because they're in a position where they actually can, can force people who might be competing with them to clean up what they want, to, to force them to do what they're trying to do and actually sometimes make it harder for those people to survive as competitors. So anyway, the wage minimums, men's never get, men never get wage minimums during this context, but they do have it for women. And it's the same issues keep popping up. And the count, court decisions are bouncing back and forth in the late teens. And Louis Brandeis, whatever, who's very big into these kind of things, he often doesn't get to vote because he was involved in the original cases that come to, come to the court. And so what you'll see here is Bunning versus Oregon, Wilson v. New, and Stetler versus O'Hara. These are all relatively close decisions. Stetler v. O'Hara is directly about the women's wage. And that was, a, that, that was the thing where the Oregon Supreme Court said it was constitutional. It came up. Brandeis, who had just joined the court, had to step down because he was involved in the Oregon case. And so it was affirmed 4-4. So they, between, you know, they have 11 minimum wage laws before 1916. They add another four. And then it comes up in Washington, D.C.'s Atkins v. Children's Hospital. And in that one, Brandeis can't vote again because he was involved in the early part of the thing. And so that one goes, five, they, it gets cut, declared unconstitutional. So from that point on, a series of decisions at the Supreme Court level and even the state Supreme Court level suggest that women's hours laws aren't going to last, aren't, aren't survivable. But what does that do to the states? Well, states are looking, they're seeing all sorts of turnover on the court. There are eight new justices after 1920. And there are also only, only five of the Atkins judges are still there in the 1930s. A whole bunch of states just continue to enforce their minimum wage law. Or when force is a little bit difficult, because in all these cases, enforcement is relatively weak. You just don't have much money to enforce these things, even the inspection laws, things along those lines. So they really are relying on people to, here's the law. We're going to expect you to do it. Public opinion is going to drive it. Massachusetts' style, they never spend any money on enforcing the law. They just publish people's names in the newspapers. And so one of the interesting cases in Massachusetts was that actually Massachusetts had tried to force newspapers to publish the names, and they were, that, that idea was struck down as unconstitutional. So, but they continued to do it anyway. But that was pretty much public opinion and kind of whether or not you follow the law were kind of what was most the enforcement was about. Okay, so the Depression, you see all sorts of wage declines. All sorts of sp states start passing new minimum wage laws. They just keep kind of adjust the language to try to avoid the problems that show up in the Atkins decision in 1923. And then you can see the list of states that pass them. And meanwhile, the National Industrial Recovery Act establishes these fair codes of competition, where essentially the industries themselves are setting wages and hours limitations. And that gets to, that's going to get declared unconstitutional because they, they gave up their responsibility for regulating. And so what you'll see, these are the justices involved in the 1930s. You've got the conservative guys, the freedom of contract justices, who the people at the time, and still try, try to call them the four horsemen of reaction. And then you have the health and safety justices on the right hand, on the, let's see, that's the, you're right, that's right. And the, the guys on the left would have called them the four horsemen of the regulatory apocalypse. And so you have these horsemen riding against each other. And here's Owen Roberts, who's kind of flipping back and forth. And he actually leans towards the health and safety thing originally. And so what they do is they strike down the NRA uniformly, but for a different reason. There's a decision in 1936 over a New York law where the New York lawyers are trying actively to avoid going head on against the decision in 1923. They were actively trying to avoid it because they want to get around it, get this new minimum wage law. Roberts is the swing voter. Roberts decides, well, you know, they really don't address this issue, so I'm just going to stick with it. So the minimum wage is still unconstitutional. So the next year, the Washington law, which has been enforced since 1913, 
10 years before they declared it unconstitutional, has been, been enforced the whole time, comes up and Robert switches because the lawyers in that decision decided, yeah, we should challenge the Atkins decision from 1923. So imagine if you're the New York lawyers trying so hard to get their law through because you're not challenging Atkins, and then to get Robert saying that, oh, yeah, I decided that I wanted to overturn Atkins, so that's why I switched my vote. So would you be happy if you were in that situation? Not me. OK, so basically they have a whole series of these things, and then they just open the door, all sorts of uh, all sorts of laws are being passed, minimum wage laws, state level, the Fair Labor Standards Act, and that kind of closes things out. OK, so the next part is collective bargaining. OK, so you can kind of see what was going on with rule of law in this case. So rule of law, Chris, when we were in, in April, asked me what, if I thought that the, the, the union guys you know, violating the law, was that a violation of rule of law? Well, in some ways, it's kind of hard to say if, the, if, it, if, the, if it's the, the people taking criminal acts or whatever, that's kind of a, there are different ways of looking at that violation of the rule of law. He seemed to think that what I should be thinking about is whether or not the, the police and other people are violating the rule of law. And I think that's true, but there's one level at which you can think about the rule of law, and that is, can you protect people and protect their property? And it was very clear in these union disputes that that just could not happen in a number of cases. Now, I should emphasize, I'm going to emphasize this, I wrote a paper about coal mining violent strikes. The most important thing to realize about these violent strikes is, is they're pretty rare. I mean, the vast majority of strikes never turn violent. They last maybe a couple of weeks, and you know, no one gets thrown out of their house. Nothing like that happens. But you get into some of these situations where it's either bad luck or it's being fomented by a handful of people, and then you get into tit-for-tat violence over an extended period of time, and you have vir virtually all-out war going on in a lot of different settings. And so I'm, I'm going to talk about the all-out war, but a lot of this really is the vast majority of strikes just don't, don't turn into these problems. OK, so you can see this is Ludlow, Colorado, where they shot up a, a, a militia camp, or, or shot up a camp of strikers. Uh, there was all sorts of questions of how this started. Actually, the best book that was written about it was written by George McGovern. It was based on his Northwestern history dissertation. And so he wrote the most even-handed description I've seen. There have been plenty of books since, but not, none of them topped what McGovern did. Um, so anyway, so they had all sorts of different things. And so one of the key things that everybody fought about was non-union pledges, otherwise known by the unions as the yellow dog contract, and that's what it gets called all the time. Um, and so you have a whole series of these. There's an Adair decision in 19, 1908 that allows the railroads to fire people. 1915, they actually stop a Kansas yellow dog contract, an anti-yellow dog contract. And Hitchman, Cole, and Culp, they decide, OK, we're, we're going we're gonna to allow that to go through in a 6-3 decision. All right, then World War I, what you get is the War Labor Board. And we talked about this a little bit before. The War Labor Board was in a position where they were actually supporting collective bargaining. They really didn't have any enforcement authority in the normal sense of the word, but they were making decisions, and people were following them because it was the wartime. It was a little risky to kind of, uh, kind of go against the president during this time period, as you can see in the various uh, free speech cases at the time. After the war is over, there's a lot of uncertainty. They're really, all the employers, are, they're going back to the original state laws. Now, whether or not the unions are going to join them or not, the employers are going back that direction. And so they fight like about, they have a huge number of strikes in 1919 and again in 1923. And a number of them turn violent. And basically, the union loses almost all these strikes. And so the unions kind of hit their nadir in American history at that time. Uh, but by the late 20s, what starts to happen is a number of uh, uh, state courts and a number of legislatures start to decide, well, we don't like the way this is tilted. And so they start passing a bunch of anti-yellow dog contracts, a bunch of armed guard, anti-armed guard con laws, and a bunch of anti-injunction laws during this time frame. And so you, know, you have to realize that almost all this action is mostly taking place at the states, and the states are kind of going their own way, even when they see these Supreme Court decisions going against them. Then in 1932, the Norris-LaGuardia Act actually promotes collective bargaining by kind of endorsing a whole bunch of these state laws that had just been passed. Then you have the National Recovery Administration code laws during this kind of things, and they promoted collective bargaining as well. The famous Schechter poultry case strikes, strikes down the NRA, but it, within the next month, they passed the National Labor Relations Act in June of 1935. But then there's an enormous amount of uncertainty. Because we don't know if that law is going to be constitutional or not. And there are some federal decisions that say it's not constitutional. 
And then there are other federal decisions that say it is. So it finally goes up to a court, and I think it's either March or April of 37. That's when they do the Jones and Laughlin steal, and they said the National Labor Relations Act is constitutional. So now we're going to have collective bargaining. But the NRA, all those kind of things, there was all sorts of uncertainty about the rules were. The, the people who were the, war, who were the board for labor disputes under the NRA were saying, well, we should go to the eventual rule we use with the National Labor Relations Act, which is if 50% of workers vote for this thing, then you're going to have one bargaining agent. But the Roosevelt administration kept pushing back against that and saying, no, we're not, we don't want to do that. You can have multiple bargaining agents and things like that. So they're having all sorts of problems. So 32 to 37 is really a period of a lot of uncertainty about what this law is going to look like. OK, so this gives you an idea in coal mining of what's going on. The violent deaths are the, the dashed line with the triangles. So these are, these are the violent deaths right in here. There's a big spike in 1914. That I'm not sure where that comes from. OK, and there's another big spike just after the war where there's a lot of uncertainty, another big spike in this during these early phase. And you can see a huge amount of strikes after the war, after the, after you, you in not World War I, and there's all this uncertainty about what's going on. There are also a lot of strikes every two years. That's because the primary contract for the union, for the UMW, ended every two years, ended on every odd year. So that's why you see all this strike activity in between. But the big point I want to point out to you, there's a lot of uncertainty in here, and you see a big surge in strike activity, a big surge in violence, state militia call-outs, things like this. And then everything's going downhill for the unions during this time frame. And then 32, then you see a lot of uncertainty again, and you see a lot of spiking again during this time frame. And so now the states themselves, states themselves have all sorts of anti-union laws. They have pro-union laws. They have arbitration laws. And so I, I did this study to go along with this to try to see, well, what's the relationship between these types of laws? These are all ways they were trying to reduce the probability of violence and reduce strike activity. Uh, there's a long list of these, so I created an index out of them. And so I ran the same kind of regressions that Christos ran. And so this is basically observational science type things, where you're actually trying to do the kind of controls you, don't do in, you can't do in a double blind. You're trying to control for all these other variables to try to, try, try to capture the stuff that actually is left over after you add the controls. And so what we find is that more strike activity is related to more men, not surprisingly, more unionization, higher coal mining prices, and higher accident rates, not lower productivity, though. I'm not sure why that would happen. But the key results are the following is anti-union laws, which you expect to raise the cost of striking and stuff, were actually associated with less strike activity in general. And also did some work to look at particular time frames during these periods of uncertainty. And what you find is they have the, the biggest negative effect during the period between 1919 and 1931 when, the unions, when there's a lot of fighting going on, but also when the unions are weak, and also after 1937 when everything's finally settled again. The pro-union laws, which are actually supporting people's rights to collective bargaining, in general, they're associated with more strike activity, but it, you, it's not statistically significant on, on the general story. But during key periods, it is. And that's during the period before World War I at all, and then during the very period of high uncertainty. The most effective thing that they did do is, during the period of high uncertainty during the New Deal, is actually they reduced strike violence by about 30%. So that, they seem to have a positive effect on eliminating those kind of problems. The arbitration laws don't seem to have much relationship with that strike activity, but they do reduce violence. Okay? They reduce it by about 7% on average over the entire time period, and they actually have stronger effects during the periods of uncertainty. So the overall, and actually I looked at the year fixed effects, and they look a lot like the original trends we saw before. So essentially, what we're really looking for here is you had these big changes over time, and there's a lot of, you know, the Lochner decision talked about freedom of contract, but it turns out that there's all sorts of uncertainty about what's going on, depending on what state you live in, also whether or not the state's going to enforce the laws, whether the state enforces after it's declared constitutional, unconstitutional. And so there's a lot of, you know, kind of, a lot of churn, a lot of trying to understand what's going on and trying to change your mind. And I have a feeling that there's more of this than we think about when we're actually looking at all sorts of legal changes over time. And one of the things I think that led to this was the Supreme Court decisions, like today, are so close that people are finding, trying to find ways to get around it. 
And then the final part was about, the, the, the other theme was about uncertainty being bad news in a lot of these cases. If the rules are uncertain about collective bargaining, that tends to lead to a lot more uncertainty about what's going on. And so there's a lot of stuff about specific laws. Diana brought up this really interesting issue about the anti-violence um, activity, anti-racketeering acts and stuff. So I investigated that. And there, there was a whole series of interesting things going on in those. So, uh, but the, essentially the thing was is that a lot of cases, the, what you would expect to see, anti-union laws slowing down strikes, pro-union laws in, increasing strikes, but the fact that the pro-union laws and the Arbitration Act actually tended to reduce violence during, of type, during times of uncertainty, I thought was, was pretty interesting. So. <laughs> Um, so this is also uh, just an incredibly rich uh, paper, and I think it's gotten richer uh, even since the last time I saw it. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to do justice to all of it. Um, but one thing I find myself wondering is is sort of what what is the narrative, the rule of law narrative that unites both halves of the paper, that unites the sort of uh, Supreme Court's battles over Lochner and freedom of contract and constitutional rights, and then the sort of the NLRA story. And I think I think. Uh, and Price sort of closed with this, the story, the, the uniting theme is this idea of the importance of legal certainty, the importance of stabilizing whatever our rules are, which plays on a very important recurring theme in law. Uh, also, I think a quote from Justice Brandeis, who's all over the place uh, today, um, that it's there are some things that are it's more important to be settled than that they be right. Uh, so even if we didn't get to the right place, you know, we at least got it settled, and maybe that's maybe that's the highest rule of law value. And that's I, I think that's the story I hear here is that it took the court a while to sort of like figure out what to do about about freedom of contract, but in the end, you know, at least they settled it. And same thing with uh, you know the NLRA and what should the what kind of strikes should we allow and how should labor relations all work. But you know, at least the virtue of the past sixty years is we've we've had it settled. Uh, and I guess I, I, now I. This, uh, in some ways, the whole presentation makes me worry that uh, that maybe some things are better right than settled, um, and so I just thought I'd take the two halves and, and express some worries about each of them. So, so the first, the struggle over the freedom of contract. Uh, you know, I, I guess I do find myself wondering. It's true that they get to a place eventually where things are pretty stable by basically giving up. Uh, by announcing that, I mean, it's sort of the the, the freedom of contract battles uh, and that that sort of Price is describing sort of culminate in the court saying uh, in the late 30s and 40s that it basically is going to forfeit all traditional review of economic legislation, uh, even while it you know then engages in quite aggressive judicial review of all sorts of social legislation. A few decades later, it sort of remains uh, a a stable rule that. Whatever kind of judicial activism we have about things, you know, we're not going to apply it to stuff like economic rights. And when in Epic, when the the dissent is accusing, uh, in a lot of these cases, sort of when the, when the some of the justices accuse the the court of trying to go back to the Lochner era, part of what they mean is that the court is engaging in a non-zero amount of judicial review of things that involve economic legislation. But but you know, so I wonder, is that? Uh, could we have found a better settlement, and should we be totally should we view this as a totally happy story for the rule of law? You know, for a while, I think the, the a lot of the justices of the court were trying to hear to a line that that was a little rough and ready, but made some sense. Uh, and and you also sort of flagged this about say the difference between health and safety on the one hand, and say maximum hours on the other hand. They were willing to say like we'll give the legislature a broad berth if they think there's a particular industry, there's a particular safety concern, if there's a regulation that goes to even worker health and safety, fine. But it was just straight up, you know, regulations on the hours people can work or the wages they can get paid. That looks a lot more to us like some form of, of I think the phrase at the time would have been class legislation. And indeed, a lot of people proposing it, defending it, like, like Brandeis, would even defend maximum hours laws partly on these grounds, that they thought it was important to spread the work around and not let the best, most productive workers make too much. Uh, and, you know, and to help uh, change our values so we didn't spend so much time worrying about material well-being. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that wasn't just about health and safety there. And as a consequence of the, I'd say, the intransigence of a lot of the states, of a lot of the state courts, of some of the justices, the court's unable to hold that line and instead has to give up on everything. Um, I don't know if we should see that as a triumph of the rule of law. Oh, cause we've yeah, because we eventually get to the stable point. I hope not. Uh, in some ways, we should see it as a failure of the rule of law, that the attempt to hold a sort of line that would make some sense and be sort of economically rational 
uh, ends up falling just because because of the sort of total intransigence of one side. Now, I should say, in my capacity as a constitutional law professor, I do also wonder, is it a rule of law question to ask where do, does any of this stuff come from in the Constitution? And, you know, the Lochner era is also criticized a lot on the grounds that the Constitution's due process clause isn't really supposed to be a font of general regulation of social rights or economic rights and so on. So, so I, I guess there's a lot of, of rule of law casualties uh, in this story <laughs> um, that, that I knew we should at least... Uh, I don't know, mourn for for a little bit. Uh, and then in the second half, we have again a sort of like a story of ultimate settlement. Uh, and, and again, I find myself, uh, the narrative seems to sort of celebrate where we get in the end, that, that we have modern labor relations law and this helps end violence. And so we should see that as at least like a, a benefit from the rule of law. We should see a rule of law cost in the previous regime. And again, I, I do find myself wondering, sort of one, how bad was it? Uh, I mean, a striking thing about the about what the, what you said and what the charts say is that the violence is ultimately pretty rare. Uh, you have a lot of strikes, and then every once in a while you have a sort of flare up of violence uh, when things get really, you know. Uh, and, and maybe that's that's just maybe that's the way the rule of law works. I mean, sort of all law enforced by the government is ultimately backed by force, and so when things are working well, you have a lot of arguments, you have a lot, a lot of say litigation. So we see a lot of lawsuits. Uh, that doesn't mean there's a rule of law problem. And then every once in a while, somebody resists or there's, you know, there's a need to kind of like enforce the law in a more dramatic way. But then, you know, we quickly clamp down on it. People get the message and we go back to where we were. So, so I could read that story and see it as a little bit more of a, a glass half full story. Uh, there were a lot of strikes, but actually the violence kind of would only flare up occasionally. And then that just, uh, you know, we sort of got, got a handle on that. And, and if not, if the violence is a problem, again, it seems like the narrative is one of... of intransigence resulting in in capitulation because uh, it seems like you know the the story is uh, if unions can't get what they want legally they'll get it illegally <laughs> so we'll have a lot of violent unrest in places where there's no pro-union legislation or right to strike and therefore in the end we adopt pro-union legislation because the sort of violent unrest forces it out of the government at the point of a gun and again, that seems maybe like it's a rule of law failure, if, that, if that's the narrative. That, that's sort of like, ultimately, there's a... And maybe that's, maybe that's not where you're going, but, but that's sort of what I worry about a little bit, um, as we see, as we could see, see this again as sort of moving in the, in the wrong direction. Uh, and then I guess the one other theme, that the economic theme, sort of unites both these, and I think you, you fly this too, is that both the regulations we end up with uh, are sort of forms of cartelization. So part of the political economy behind both uh, rounds of legislation, right? Or that leading industry players decide to go along with regulations that raise the cost of doing business because they can afford to pay the increased cost of doing business and lots of smaller players and new entrants can't. Uh, and so you get a kind of cartelization of the economy by major economic interests. Uh, I don't know if that's a rule of law problem or, or just a problem, but it does seem like a problem. Uh, so I guess I... I, I what, this seemed to end in a pretty. It should end on a darker note than maybe the one you you portrayed. Maybe that's maybe that's just not your not your personality. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but curious to hear what you say. So Price, you've been accused of being too happy and optimistic. <laughs> well, let me let me make a couple of comments. Uh, yeah, that's right. Exactly. Uh, so one of the interesting things in the when they. In some ways or whatever, there's a more optimistic note for the rule of law. What you have is all these various different rules going against each other, right? You've got association, rules of association, freedom of association going in both different directions. But if you're, if you're talking about unionization in general, if you look at the outcome, the, you, have, you allow for collective bargaining in this context. And so you know, most, a lot of the fights were about being maltreated by the law, by in, in, way too many injunctions and all sorts of things along those lines. But once we established a rule where you could unionize and legally unionize or whatever, the, the ultimate market test has been is there's not that much unionization anymore in the private sector. It's primarily in the public sector, but you've re reduced the violence quite a bit with the rules that you've come up with. Um, and so in that sense, where we kind of adjusted to that. And then on the minimum wage type things or whatever, they really were making these health and safety arguments. It's just because of the depression, everything was going down so badly, everybody was talking about you. You know, people are just not living, not getting a minimum standard of living. And so that was part of the argument that they were making. 
But if you look at the history of the minimum wage in the United States, I mean, it's the same kind of process where we go through, we, the inflation eats away at the minimum wage. And finally, after it eats away such that it's not being effective anymore, they, and, they don't, and employers don't really care anymore, they, they raise it. But they never really raise it to a level that's really going to be binding in a lot of these various cases. So, so I'm a little bit more positive than you are about the outcome. Uh, so I'll be keeping a cue, and we begin with uh, Bob Topel. And this question, Price, this has to do with your um, your coal time series, mm -hmm. and you, you know you, you stopped in 1941, and one understands that there was a significant event that year, but you know we just had some students do a project on coal mining employment, you know, in the in the modern era, but they took their data back to 1950, so they're starting right after you, right, quit, right, right. And I said, and they were, they were working on, well, what's going to happen to coal miners, you know, employment-wise from West Virginia? And you look back in 1950, and coal mining plummet, employment just plummets in the 50s by about 50%. And I said, what the heck happened there? And they explained that the, that the, the union and the coal miners had reached an agreement on mechanization of the mines. And prior to that, there had been huge violence in the mines up until the 1950s. But then they reached a deal, and of course, the, it was uh, last in, first out. So you need 51% of the guys to approve the contract. And they were able to mechanize the mines. It seems like it sort of fits within your, your theory in the sense that the, the contracts, you know, property rights were ill-defined before, bef before 1941, and then, or whenever the court decided. And then, you know, they were kind of well defined and they could be bargained over once that was w once the, that was established so i wonder if you could try to fit that in and the related question is how much of the 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 violence and strikes and so on and injuries and things in the mines prior to the prior to the 40s was really organizing activity versus the kind of thing we're talking about here that no we don't want you bringing in these machines to dig the coal because it's going to displace us so the, there's actually a long history of, of mechanization going on before they're replacing pick miners in the init, initial regulation. So the new regulation was, repla was, was kind of replacing the whole thing in a lot of cases, or moving to strip mining. Um, I would say that there's, there's not very much violence in the 40s. I mean, the violence really ends before World War, World War, I, before World War II. There may be some violence right in the middle of it, but uh, the numbers I've seen suggest very little coal mining violence and strikes during that time frame in the 40s. But the, there's a, the history of coal miners. They had 700,000 coal miners in World War I. By 1930, there were 300,000. So there's a long history of declining. And so I can see the point they're trying to make, but I think they oversell the violence of the 40s. Right. So they, they, were, they were replacing guys in the underground mines with continuous miners. With the, they just clawed at the machine and things like that. But I can, I can buy their story about the, 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 the you know, you got a bunch of guys gone, and now you can actually vote for mechanization because you're the one keeping your job. John Wallace? Yeah, I kind of, this falls a little bit on what Bob was asking, and I think is um, a strength of Price's work, not only in this paper, but overall, which is that um, it, in terms of the rule of law, the National, the National Labor Relation Act really sets up a set of property rights <laughs> and procedures that are very unclear before that. Right, there are all kinds of laws, um, but it's it. There are when there are strikes. Very often, the, the the violence occurs because it's not clear exactly who has the right to be associated how. And so, a lot of the violence is initiated, partly by the employers. Like it's it's not always the union guys going out and destroying stuff. And when the government tends to come in, they tend to come in on the side of the employers. So it. They they are not an they are not an impartial third party in these disputes, which then complicates the problem of how do you reach an agreement about what the law is if you know the enforcer is not going to be unbiased when it comes to disputes, okay? And so we've talked about this paper before, and Price mentions it here, um, but Margaret Levy and Barry Weingast and a couple of their students have a paper. It it is a kind of a bargaining model that what happens in the 30s is the government particularly the federal government, is able to credibly say, okay, we're going to enforce this rule in a clear and unbiased way. Here's the, here's the procedure for establishing a union. And once you do that, we're going to enforce the rule. And the violence 
pretty those kind of violent episodes go down. And as Price says in much of his work, this really happens when enough employers are willing to say, okay, let, let's, let's go along with that, as opposed to this being shoved down the throat of the employers. And so instead of having two groups that are always at odds with one another, they have a mutual accommodation. They need to trust in the rule of law that there will be a third party that will enforce the rules in an unbiased way. When they finally get to that point, then the employers and the unions are able to reach an agreement, which then leads to ultimately the declines in unions, <laughs> but also then really solves the problem of violence. And I think that's a really strong story that is a little bit different than Will's interpretation. So let me say something about that. So there, they, even though the, the, when the governor sends in the state militia, they might start out trying to be unbiased. The biggest problem is, is that there are a lot of miners and, and the miners are going after property and things like this. And so almost, no matter what you do, you're going to end up protecting the mine. And then you end up being seen as being on their side. So one thing that I think Diana is about to raise her hand, so I needed to put this in, and I didn't do it very well, is she pointed out this Anti-Racketeering Act of 1934, and there was an amendment in 1947 that actually um, the original 34 Act was supposed to go after mobsters and things like this, but they also was trying to make it criminal activity and, and very strongly a felony to, to do certain things during a strike. And then in the early 40s or whatever, they, there was a court decision that took the teeth out of that completely. And then they put the teeth back in in 1946 or 47. And that, too, actually, I think, had a pretty powerful effect. So, but she probably has other things to say. So, can I interrupt? So on this story with the NLRA, and I like that story better, obviously, I wonder if you would then critique sort of what the NLRA has done more of in the past 40 or 50 years, where it seems like they engage in not just sort of like enforcing the rules of the game, but a lot of sort of substantive rulemaking where they decide that, you know, they change the rules of who can unionize or not. They try to have these rules, but whether you can have an arbitration contract or not. Like they, they seem to now act like they're a sub labor regulator. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit. And, and it seems right. like that might compromise their status as a neutral third party, especially because now both parties then think they got to get their guys in at the NLRA, and it becomes a more partisan. Job. Well, and they do go back and forth. Yeah, <clears throat> is that is that sort of? Am I right that that should, that that's actually really problematic under this story? I mean, yeah, I think they do go back and forth. Now, I just don't know enough about the NRA afterwards, and so that's where Diana comes in. So I'd like to remind everyone of the Charles Calamiris's law about uh, increasing the length of questions and responses. Uh, so try to be a little bit brief, so sure. we can get as many in as possible. Diana? Well, well, first of all, it's the National Labor Relations Board, the act yeah. put in place the board. Yeah. Right. And uh, there's a section on my paper on some of the excessive rulings uh, of the National Labor Relations Board. But uh, I, I just want to make a quick comment when you said that our health um, regulations have generally passed without any effect. Uh, the ergonomics rule in 2001 was one of the first uses of the Congressional Review Act. It was uh, rolled back. Uh, by the George W. Bush administration, and that would have uh, uh, placed penalties on employers for having, for example, cords you might trip over or mm. a uh, seat, for example, that wasn't uh, good for sitting on. So this uh, is the first one to get rolled back? Uh, the first use of the Congressional Review Act was to roll back the OSHA ergonomics rule, yeah, okay. in 2001 that was put in place by President Clinton. Uh, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the motivation behind uh, these minimum uh, wage laws. Um, reading uh, Thomas Leonard's Illiberal Reformers, uh, he suggests that the minimum wage laws and the hours work laws uh, were intended to keep out women, minimum wage laws to keep out women, blacks, and immigrants, uh, that they were not purely motivated. It was, as you say, uh, a cartel trying to keep out other people. And this was not for health and safety. It was to keep out people who they didn't want to have work. Well, there, there's always the potential for that element to be true. But, uh, but, but that was the motivation. That's what he ascribes the motivation. Yeah, I'm, having, I'm, struggling, I'm struggling with that one to some extent. I mean, the, the arguments that were made by the courts and the arguments made by the people in the American Labor Legislation Review and things like that who were pushing it, they were arguing, and they particularly got a lot of bang out of the Great Depression because wages were falling. They were arguing that they were just the wages were at low enough levels and facing all this unemployment that you couldn't that people couldn't negotiate a living wage in a sense. Now this is you know the same fight we're having today as you know what is the living wage and things along those lines. Now you could get these uh, you get these uh, these 
unhappy effects that you actually do. As a matter of fact, the, the women's hours law is the biggest effect, according to Claudia Golden, was to actually increase men's employment as opposed to women's employment and right. things along those lines. Uh, whether or not it was anti-minority and things like that, I don't... Uh, well, yes, because minorities had fewer skills, and women had fewer skills, and, uh, and uh, so raising these minimum wage laws had the effect of keeping these groups out just the same way as high minimum wage laws now have the effect of keeping the young and unskilled out of the labor market. Well, yeah, I don't... Uh, yeah, I think that, and, that uh, that's, that's certainly Lennon a fact. Gives, uh, Thomas Lennon gives very persuasive... I'm just, what I was talking about, when I was talking about the things, I mean, you can get these effects. As a matter of fact, I, I agree that minimum wages in, in large part have actually done a lot of damage to minority teenagers in terms of job opportunities and things like that, and other people who are, who are, less, or who are less skilled and stuff. Uh, I was just talking about the arguments that the, actual, the people who passed the laws were making mm -hmm. when they were making the statement. Uh, there's a similarly a pretty persuasive story that the Baker maximum hour law in, in, in Lochner uh, was really a kind of an ethnic fight between, I believe it was German Jewish and Eastern European Jewish bakers who had a different, the German Jewish bakers had, were more capital intensive and had one method of baking that involved single, um, you know, what, sort of one continuous work period, whereas the cheaper, less capital intensive Eastern European Jewish bakers had a system in which you had to have two separate uh, uh, periods of baker activity during the middle of which the bakers would be sort of sitting around but still on the job. Mm -hmm. And this was the wealthier German Jewish bakers passing a law basically to put the cheaper mm -hmm. competition and, of course, Eastern European competition out of business. Well, of course, those who wanted to pass a higher minimum wage would not say that it was to keep no, women and minorities that. out, but that was, that was there. So, uh, other... I would like to know why the, um, the courts and why was the debate framed around separating freedom of association from freedom of contract, since, at least in my view, both are just the same. If you are an employer, you can hire whoever you want, and if they want to be part of a union, they can, but if you don't want to hire them as a union, then there's no contract. I mean, shouldn't freedom of association have the same meaning in any case? I don't understand why there's a different Well, meaning. so the fight, the, a lot of times, well, so there are different fights going on. So the, the freedom of contract versus freedom of association was really over the non-union pledges. And so the argument was is that, uh, that if you signed a non-union pledge, then that was part of freedom of contract and also allowed you to associate with who you want to. But if you didn't have the, but if you fired people automatically because they wanted to unionize and things like that, then you're, you're, you're fighting about freedom of contract there because the employer, it was an at will contracting system, right? So you can't force people to stay, you can't force people to, and you can't force yourself to be an employee, right? But then the question becomes, well, can the workers be, be able to join together with other people and negotiate with the employer as a group. That's the freedom of association on the unionized side. And so at the time, the law, the way it worked was is the employer could ignore them and they could fire them if they decided to join together in that. So that was part of the issue that was going on. So the NLRA actually was trying to resolve that issue of, well, if you have enough workers, they're going to make you negotiate with them if they have 50% or four, more than 50% of the workers say they want a collective bargaining group. So that was the key change there. Uh, in, a, in a similar Can vein. Can I just say something back to, sure, back to that? Sure, Yeah. Um, well, I, I, comp I mean, I understand that that was the purpose of the act, of course, but if the workers also have the freedom of association between themselves, then the employer should also have the freedom of, of association to fire them if he doesn't want to negotiate with the union. It's, I understand it's, like a, it's, most, it's mostly an opinion of mine, oh, yeah. but um, if freedom of association will, goes both ways is what I'm trying to say. No, I understand. And so the way things were before, though, if you, join, if you group together in a union, and, and then the employer could fire you just because you had joined together in a union and to, or joined together with a group of people. And so I think that, you know, so now you're getting into, well, who are your friends? Can the employer fire you because you have a certain group of friends? And so that, you know, so you really are, you've got these tensions. This is why you have these Supreme Court decisions trying to make these decisions, because you're weighing different rights or different freedoms. Uh, a similar vein to Daniel's question about these, uh, these 
sort of categories of, of, of rights or interests. I think of, I wonder about health and safety and whether that actually maps not about, I mean, there's no particular reason why the Constitution would treat health and safety laws any different than anything else. Right. But it might treat effects on third parties different from paternalistic legislation purportedly designed to protect the worker himself. And at least some of the cases you're talking about map out onto that. Holden against Hardy, for example. They talk about health and safety, but what right. that's really about is that when you're mining, uh, uh, having a sleepy person next to you uh, working could easily kill you right. because right. Uh, because you're so dependent upon each other to be careful uh, uh, and and railroad workers similarly you don't want them falling asleep at the switch and so I I wonder if this whole jurisprudence wouldn't have had a less of a of a made up feel to it. If instead of talking about health and safety, it had said, well, these are laws that are designed to protect third, un unconsenting third parties against the dangers. Well, they use those the arguments nuts. as part of the story. Matter of fact, the more that there's some externality effect and but things like that. the category they're speaking of, oh, yeah. they say ridiculous things like states only have the power to pass laws for health, safety, welfare, and morals. Where does that come from? They yeah, just made I, it up. I, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> and I think if they had substituted a different vocabulary, the, uh, uh, the jurisprudence might have looked less contrived. So, in their defense, I don't think they made it up. I think some treatise writers in the 1870s made it up. <laughs> uh, and they made it up in, in a treatise trying to say kind of what, what you just said, that sort of the part of the state's job is to regulate the effect on third parties, but then they tried to like systematize it and make it sound... Sophisticated, and maybe the the real lesson is that law professors make everything worse. <laughs> so one of, one of the things that I learned a lot, though, you know, because I've been writing about labor legislation for a long time, but writing this paper actually made me fully appreciate just the back and forth that was going on between the courts and uh, in the laws in a lot of these cases. Uh, so we uh, not seeing any uh, John. We do have time for just one quick thing about the association. <laughs> And, and th because this union stuff is occurring at the end of the 19th century, when um, the scope, the scale of organizations is really changing. And so you can think about what are the laws that support association that enable groups to form. And what's happening is that the laws that are enabling businesses to organize are changing rapidly and permitting scale on an unprecedented size at the same time that those laws are being interpreted is not applying to, to labor organizations. So, so you know, the capital labor, if you want to put it in those terms, capital is getting all kinds of new organizational tools, and labor is still being stuck with the old 18th century statute of laborers kind of tools. And that's, so there really is an asymmetry in the freedom to associate. And what's not just freedom, it's also the tools to associate. What's even worse is, is like things like the Sherman I Trust Act that was supposed to control worker, I mean, corporations and businesses, their first uses were primarily against labor unions. <laughs> and so, that, as a matter of fact, the first 10 years is like this, this, well, let's just beat on labor unions using the Sherman Act.